welcome to In The Zone, our podcast series from the Middle East Treaty Organization, bringing you interviews with all kinds of interesting people who are involved with efforts to eliminate weapons of mass destruction from the region. I'm your co-host, Anna Hita. And I'm Tony. This week, we're kickstarting a new season of podcasts with a very nice interview that we recorded at last year's World Peace Congress in Barcelona, organized by the International Peace Bureau. In this interview, we had the opportunity to speak to Jeremy Corbyn, former leader of the UK Labour Party and an inspirational figure to young people all over the world who are concerned about the dangers of militarism and the growing destruction of the global economy and the environment. I I want to start with a question which is related to the topic of your your talk yesterday, um, which was focused on the threats to the future of of humanity. Can you tell us briefly about, in your opinion, what are the major threats to, to humanity? The major threats to humanity are multiple. If you take stock of what the world is at the moment, the first one is an environmental disaster that is with us. Climate change, global warming, biodiversity loss, pollution of air and sea, and uh, the loss of agricultural capability by the destruction of the natural world. And so we have to change course on that, otherwise there's going to be food supply problems in the future. Increasing desertification and all that goes with that. Next, of course, associated with that, and unusual weather patterns and the flooding that goes with it and the forest fires that go with it. Again, you can deal with it to some extent by mitigation methods, um, but you have to look at the causes of it. And what I was pointing out in my talk yesterday was that um, different parts of the world are able to cope with things differently. I quoted the floods in Germany, devastating as they were. Germany is a sophisticated, wealthy, well-organized society. They could get help and get support to people very quickly. Mozambique, equally terrible floods happened two years ago. The remotest villages didn't see anybody for a month. They had to cope on their own. There is no infrastructure of emergency nature to support them. So that's the environment side of it. The second side of it is global poverty and war. They're linked. The 70 million refugees we currently have are mostly victims of war, not all, but mostly victims of war. And the wars that we've had in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, obviously have been devastating and as we we're hearing this afternoon in a very interesting talk on indigenous peoples around the world there are 300 other conflicts around the world often seen as relatively low level or simply not reported by most of the mainstream media at all so the danger of war is huge the danger of nuclear war and proliferation is huge, which is why I made a big emphasis in my speech about the dangers of the Australia-UK-US nuclear pact, um, because it puts Britain back into a sort of 1940s, 50s mentality in giving itself a global role. Even Harold Wilson withdrew from East of Suez in 1966. Johnson has taken us back into this global role increased British defence expenditure by 24 billion, cut overseas aid, and also cut expenditure on local government, welfare, and so many other uh, things. So that's Britain's contribution to making the world a more dangerous place. And the strategy is to develop a Cold War against China. And uh, I don't think either the US or China actually want to go to war with each other. I don't think that for a moment. It would be too stupid and too crazy. But They're very keen on building up tensions against each other, which will spin off either into an accident um, or will spin off into a proxy war somewhere. Proxy wars have happened in Korea, in Vietnam, in Central America, um, and many of the wars in Africa, particularly in the 70s and 80s, were in reality proxy wars for the um, Cold War. So those are two areas. And the third one is... um, global poverty, health and inequality. The COVID crisis has shown us just how dangerous um, we are, uh, what dangers we face from a pandemic. The World Health Organization has warned against these for 20 years, saying there are lots of viri that will mutate. And it, it doesn't really matter 
where the virus started. The reality is once a virus is out there, it can mutate and vaccines become less and less effective as time goes on. Um, unless we have an approach that believes that everyone has access to health care, then it's going to happen and uh, many people suffer from it. Ebola surely was a warning to everyone of just how dangerous these kind of virus can be. And so the global poverty levels and inequality are massive. And at the same time, we have the uh, World Bank and International Monetary Fund pushing yet more inequality and free market economics around the world, when surely the issues ought to be, we measure our success by the number of children that are not hungry, the number of people that do get health care, and the life expectancy and life chances of people. And so that means a challenge that has to be to the principles behind free market economics, all of which are the issues that um, I was developing in our party's policy and developing in the manifestos that we put forward. None of those issues have gone away or changed. And um, that's why I'm delighted to be here in Barcelona at the International Peace Bureau's um, conference about reimagining the world. And I was very honored to be invited to give um, an address on this subject last night. Thank you. Amazing. And in light of all these threats that you mentioned, the challenges that we face, you recently launched your Peace and Justice project. Yeah. And we were wondering what visions you have for it, <coughs> what motivates you and what your hopes are for its future. After the general election uh, result of 2019, we had a lot of discussions about um, future politics and future organisation and I was very keen that there be a place that we can develop the policies that we've been working hard on, economy, Green New Deal, Green Industrial Revolution, all of those policies. And so we decided to establish the project for peace and justice around the world. We worked on the um, modalities of it, of forming a company limited by guarantee and raising some initial money to get it started. We then were ready to do a launch and then the um, COVID lockdown came, then we delayed and um, some people said don't do it till after COVID's over and I said no we can't wait that long, let's do it. And so we did a, um, a virtual uh, announcement than a virtual launch last January. So we've only been going for nine months. 500,000 people came to the virtual launch. 50,000 have signed up and um, a lot of those are contributing small amounts of money each month. So we're not huge and wealthy uh, but we have, an, uh, we have money coming in which is able to employ a small core team of people and we've set ourselves four areas of work. The first one, they're not in any particular priority, but because they're all very important. The first area of work is on media, media ownership, media control, news values and access to the media, which is very much what the work is you're doing. Because unless people around the world have an ability to communicate with each other, and not always be moderated through the values and the news values of mainstream media, then we're simply not going to get that message across. I've witnessed at first hand the ability of the British mainstream media to um, basically run a five-year assassination program, character assassination program, on um, individuals, and it's horrible. And it's effective. Mm -hmm. it, does have, it has a big effect. And so having an alternative media source is important. I set these ideas out initially at the McTaggart Lecture I gave in 2018 in Edinburgh. And we've developed them since then. And we held a big event in Manchester uh, during the Tory party conference. It wasn't completely a coincidence. And um, we are working with other groups around the world on this, good people like yourself, because unless we have some effective form of independent communication and we don't allow Google, Amazon, Facebook, YouTube to be those that decide who can talk to each other and close down communication when it suits them, look at the way the Indian farmers have been treated, 
um, then we're sunk. The technology is neutral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The technology is for all of us to use, and the technology now at our disposal is amazing. Mm -hmm. I think of as a young person active in the peace movement, I used to think it was a great achievement to spend all night in a little room turning the handle of a duplicator to produce a couple of thousand leaflets and go and deliver them. Yeah. I can go onto Twitter and send out a message that can go to four million people yeah. straight away, or millions, millions of And so the technology is there for us to use. Second area of work is on environment, the Green Industrial Revolution and Green New Deal. Unless we have an environment program and a Green New Deal that does not result in greater poverty amongst those people who suffer from poor quality food, air pollution or work in polluting industries, it's only going to come through public investment. So you publicly invest in industries in order to green them. You set up a green industrial revolution, you have green uh, energy production. And we are working hard on all of that. And we've got a whole program of events on at COP26. Our principle is we'll be there to help with all the other groups to give voice to the global south and to working class communities uh -huh. from Britain. Um, the third area is economic justice. and. Uh, as um, leader of the Labour Party, I had a, a huge battle with the Labour Party bureaucracy on many fronts, one of which was to set up a community organising unit so that the party became more involved in community organising. It's no good turning up in an election time with a suit on and say, here I am, I'm the best thing you've ever wanted. You've got to be there in the good days and the bad days, the days when you're defending a hospital as well as the days when you're winning things part of the community. It's about empowering communities. Political power doesn't just come from elected office. It comes from the work of people in communities and on the ground. And so we're working on economic justice. We're working with food co-ops and food banks, obviously, but most hopefully and helpfully are now converting into co-ops and working with Ian Byrne on his right to food campaign, the one that he set up in Liverpool. And um, we're working with another group called Wearshare, which is a, a clothing co-op for people that are using food banks or food co-ops. We're working on all of those issues, in a sense replicating the community work we used to do. And the last area is one of international solidarity, which is um, one of the reasons I'm here in Barcelona. And uh, I see that solidarity as crucial and important. Uh, in the sense that um, post-pandemic the world can either go in the direction of back to business as usual, back to free market economics, back to greater inequality and back to big pharma holding all the, all the aces in healthcare or it can go in a different direction. We're weakened by our isolation, we're strengthened by our cooperation so it is about community groups around the world and uh, we've organized a number of events one of which was I was keen on the anniversary of the 1951 convention on refugee rights to celebrate it not because it's been a complete success it hasn't it's had some effect but it's not been a complete success but by giving voice to refugees so in one afternoon uh, we did a refugee voices call and we had 10,000 people on it and we had voices from many refugee camps around the world. And we're, that's what we're organising more of for the future in cooperation with Progressive International and others. And so it's that sort of series of links and contacts we're building up. And we're just talking today about how we can organise some future events and webinars. Everything, to me, should be a combination of physical and online. So the project is, is there. It's there and it's got huge numbers of people involved. It's quite hard to keep up with all the enthusiasm of, <coughs> of volunteers that get in touch or turn up, but that's a good problem to have. Yeah. That's the kind of problem you want to deal Absolutely. with. Um, Mato is working towards the implementation of a WMD free zone in the Middle East. And I'm interested to know what your opinions are and um, what kind of obstacles you think we're facing in terms of achieving that and what the way forward is. And also, I think it would be quite interesting to know whether during your time as the leader of the Labour Party, if your opinions on the project changed because of the possibility of how close we were to having a Labour government. Um, <coughs> I joined CND when I was 
15. I'm a member of CND and will always be one. Um, and nuclear weapons to me are appalling at any level. And the process of uh, an anti-nuclear defence and foreign policy is a complex one. The Labour government in the 60s promoted the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty whilst at the same time developing nuclear weapons. There is a contradiction there. There are many contradictions in all of this. The anti-nuclear movement got us the nuclear-free zones and got then the concept of a Middle East um, free from weapons of mass destruction which is more than just nuclear weapons because they cannot obviously be biological or chemical as well. And I've attended a lot of NPT um, prep comms as well as the review conferences themselves. And all of them have discussed at some point weapons of mass destruction free zone for the Middle East and made some progress. The five declared nuclear weapon states um, give a nod in its direction but do nothing about it and indeed in the case of um, Britain and the USA you've quite specifically undermined the um, nuclear agreement with Iran which to Iran's credit has still not developed nuclear weapons clearly um, have a considerable capability and so I think any project that can by using careful building blocks, build support all across the region in every one of the countries towards getting a um, weapons of mass destruction free zone has got to be a, a good way forward. And we just had a very interesting workshop here at the um, uh, and, uh, this conference we're in in Barcelona and it was, uh, I learned a great deal from it. Now were the problems in getting the policies in as leader of the party? Absolutely yes, because my views on nuclear weapons were very well known. The manifestos I put forward included implementation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and I'd also made statements in support of the Global Ban Treaty. Unfortunately, Labour Party conferences have successively voted for uh, maintenance of Trident and so um, the Conservatives forced a vote in Parliament on nuclear weapons in um, 2016. I um, insisted to the party that I would not whip the party to vote for it because I didn't believe in it and I then proposed a free vote in which I continued my vote against nuclear weapons. I've never voted to support nuclear weapons in, in Parliament. Um, it's a campaign that's got to be won. It's, got long, it's a long-term campaign. But it is also, and this is where the peace movement sometimes shortcuts into a, a, a good future. They don't realise the numbers of people and the psychology of those that work in industries or related industries that do manufacture arms, do manufacture nuclear capable vessels, we've got to guarantee those jobs. There's got to be an arms conversion policy. And I made it very clear that um, we would protect all those jobs and at the same time start to convert those shipbuilding and aircraft making capacities into making socially useful products. If you leave it to the market, as was done in 1990, when there was, for five years or so, a cut in arms expenditure, it ended up with highly skilled people losing their jobs. The skills are amazing. Mm. The technology is amazing. It just could be used for better purposes. And so, uh, did I face problems on this? Absolutely. And uh, some of it was almost funny. In, in the space of a few days, um, by many newspapers, I was condemned as being a threat to our society because I'd said uh, I would not use nuclear weapons. And then, a few days later, I was condemned as being a danger to the whole world because I would have my finger on the nuclear button. It can't be both. The, the UK, with very few exceptions, has been governed by the right for well over a century. There, are, there were some good periods of, of uh, progressive government, but 
majority of the time it's been uh, governed by the right. Is it time for the left to actively promote proportional representation as a way to create progressive coalitions of, for instance, left and greens in order to prevent forever the worst excesses of the right? Um, that's a big issue. Um, the Labour Party conference debated it and rejected it. I was quite surprised it rejected it, mainly on trade union votes. I think the majority of constituency parties supported PR. My constituency does. I don't have a problem with it, except I just put one very strong caveat in. I think it's very important that members of parliament have a direct relationship with a constituency. Because if you go to a regional list, or worse still, a national list, actually what you do is hand power to the party bureaucracy rather than the community that um, somebody is elected for. Will it happen in the near future? No, the Conservatives are certainly not going to vote for it um, in Parliament and um, that means that we have to campaign very hard for the kind of left policies that we put forward. We managed a very high vote of over 40% in 2017, we went down to 32 and a half in 2019 and we lost the election. But if you look at that vote historically, and it, it's in a sense um, made worse because of the first past the post system, we got a higher proportion of the vote that was achieved at the previous three general elections by the Labour Party in 5, 10 and 15. Um, and if you take it on a European level, I remember going to a party of European Socialist meeting and said I was very sorry that we only got 32.5% of the vote in the general election. And they all looked to me saying, wow, <laughs> none of us get above 20%. And even the German SPD, which are now celebrating an election win on 27% of the vote. And so I realised that a first-past-the-post system does in a sense exaggerate the support for the two main parties that is inevitable but let's not run away with the idea that all socialist ideas and values have disappeared they haven't they're alive they're there and the battles of this year are going to be on austerity are going to be on job losses are going to be on wages are going to be on benefits are going to be on housing are going to be on environment and are going to be internationally on peace and justice and so we all got to be out there doing that campaigning. Thank you. And um, I guess finally for me, what gives you the strength and the hope to continue in your commitment? There's no home but the struggle. <laughs> There's a, I recommend you read a lovely novel. It was written in the 1930s by a man called Edward Upward, mm -hmm. whose um, family were probably a bit fed up with him being very politically active. Because in those days, being politically active meant going out all the time to meetings. It's different now. And he wrote this book, No Home But the Struggle. And it's, it's lovely. Yes, um, I want the next generation not to grow up in debt, hunger, poverty, and threatened by war. That's why I do, That's why I do what I do. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks to Jeremy for that amazing interview. After chasing him around the conference venue for two days, we were very happy to finally get it. You can follow our podcast series on SoundCloud, Spotify and YouTube. We also invite you to visit our website, www.wmd-free.me, where you can find out everything about the Middle East Treaty Organization and the incredible activities we're putting in motion. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn and TikTok with the handle at WMDFreeME. Come back for more episodes coming soon. Bye.